hope is built on nothing less.
do trust in Jesus alone with all our hope, with all our praise and our joy and our salvation. As we continue to meet together, we look to you knowing that you are here with us, ready to be right here with your arms wrapped around us. And we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God, I love to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I love to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. And I will love you, Lord, my strength. And I will love you, Lord, my shield. And I will love you, Lord, my rock. Forever, all my days, I will love you, God. Yes, God. We just continue to look to you. God, I love to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me vision to see things like you do. God, I love to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do And I will love you, Lord, my strength Sing it out And I will love you, Lord, my shield And I will love you, Lord, my rock Forever, all my days I will love you Elizondo, Kids Church Director here at Two Rivers Bible Church. 
This week I was thinking about tithing and I realized that it serves two purposes. The first one is that it's an action. It's an action that we take to demonstrate to God that we trust Him. When we take a small portion of the money that God has entrusted us with and give it back to our church, it's letting God know that we trust Him to fill in that gap. And we know that He will provide for all our needs. The second purpose is it's giving back to your church family. You see, even though we're not meeting right now in the facility, we still have bills to pay. We still have rent, we still have electricity, and we still have office supplies. And right now we're in the process of ordering things to make us feel more safe and secure whenever we do meet again as a church family, like face masks, hand sanitizer, and we're in the process of getting these little buckets to hang throughout the church. That way you can just drop your tithing in there and you don't have to worry about passing down an offering plate to your neighbor. But all these things cost money. So we wanna thank you in advance for your generosity. And we cannot wait to open those church doors again and say, Welcome home. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability to give back to our church, Lord, and that when we do that, you promise to provide for us, Lord. The Bible says that you say that we can test you on this matter. And so, Lord, we thank you that we have a church family that's willing to go on that limb and test you, Lord, and know that you are going to provide for all our needs, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hi, I'm Jesse, lead pastor for Two Rivers Bible Church. Welcome to today's online worship service. Glad you can make it. You dialed in wherever you may be at. You may be at home with your family all together just listening to today's uh, worship service. You may be taking a break from work and just kind of dialing in to see how today's word would impact your life. And you will not be disappointed because anytime we engage in God's word, we, we get something out of it. It doesn't uh, return void. If you have your Bibles there with you, I want you to turn to uh, Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. Some of you have your uh, electronic Bibles, uh, just go down and scroll down to Matthew chapter 8, verse 23. I'm going to start off with a question. What if worry could be broken as easily as one can break a pencil? What if uh, breaking worry in your life could be this easy? Well, the reality is, is that it, it isn't, right? It, we, we all wish it was this easy. We all wish that we could break worry this simply, but the reality is, is that for most of us, worry is a long life struggle. Worry is something that keeps on invading our life, keeps on uh, just barging in into our heart, and repeatedly we have to address this issue of worry. The struggle is real. I looked at the latest statistics on worry, and I saw this, that 40% of people are worrying on things that will never happen. I saw that 30% of, of people worry on things in the past that can't be changed. That 12% of worry is on criticism of others or from others, by and large criticism that's not even true. We saw that 10% of worrying has to do with health issues, and when we worry about health issues, we get stressed and therefore we get more unhealthy. And only 8% of worry is on real problems that will be faced in life. I thought that was interesting. You see, worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it really takes you nowhere. It takes you emotionally where you don't want to go and, and lets you be there way longer than you want to stay there. And so today, I want to look at what causes worry and how can we reduce worry in our life. And we're going to look at Scripture to see that very thing. So, uh, go to Matthew, uh, 
chapter 8, verse 23, we're going to see a small boat on a large lake, the Sea of Galilee. And it says, then Jesus got into a boat and started across the lake with his disciples. Suddenly, a fierce storm struck the lake with waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. Man, I love that. There's something about that story that for me, it just tickles my heart. I'm like, Jesus, man, the, there's a storm around us. And the disciples are like, whoa, this, Jesus is actually asleep. He's taking a siesta. He's just kind of chilling there. Uh, but we can see a lot about this passage and what causes worry. Because the disciples are going to respond with a whole lot of worry. And so we're going to see what causes this worry. We tend to worry when we have unexpected problems problems. You see, the storm was unexpected. It just came out of nowhere. The Sea of Galilee is nestled within a wind funnel where storms come up, and when the, the storms come up, it's unexpected. People don't expect the storms when they come up there in the Sea of Galilee. And so here this becomes this problem, and it's unexpected. And when we have that in our lives, when something comes into our lives that we didn't anticipate, we didn't expect, Man, that's when worry begins to invade our life. That's when worry becomes more prominent in our life. I mean, certainly we can say that COVID-19 was unexpected. COVID-19 here in our city and in our state, we felt like at some point it just barraged itself in here. And for many of us, it caught us by surprise. It's when that bill that, that comes in the mail comes in there, you're thinking, where did this come from? I mean, I, I thought all my bills were paid. Is that unexpected bill? Is, is the fact that maybe for some of you, you don't have child care. You, you were expecting to have child care, but you don't have child care, but you still have to go to work. And, and you're wrestling this whole idea of what do I do? It's an, ex, an unexpected situation. And when that happens, we tend to worry. Maybe during this time, you found out that you had a tumor or, or that you have some other disease or sickness and it was unexpected, and so now you're worried. It's just that storm in your life. They came out of nowhere, just like storms would come out of nowhere in the Sea of Galilee. And, and for some of you, what you need to hear is that storms are normal. Storms happen. The unexpected happens. But when it happens, since we don't anticipate those, we tend to worry. The second thing is this, is that we, we tend to worry when we are overwhelmed by our circumstances. The waves in this situation, they're ginormous compared to the size of the boat. They're big. They're overwhelming. And the, the experienced fishermen, I mean, they've fished a long time. They, they know how to fish. They've seen tons and tons of storms, storms that, you know, for them as fishermen would have said, you know, ah, this is just a little storm, right? Well, in this case, it's not just a little storm. It's a big storm. And if fishermen who are very, very well experienced in the day uh, there in the, in the Sea of Galilee are freaking out, they're worried, is because it's a big deal. It's a big, big wave. And so they're overwhelmed by their circumstances, and maybe that's where you're at right now. You're overwhelmed by the circumstances. Maybe you got laid off and you're like, you're overwhelmed. You don't know how to start the process of filing for unemployment. Maybe you're overwhelmed because you're a business person and you're trying to make it. You're just trying to survive. You're trying to put your head over water, but you don't have enough staff because you can't afford it right now because your business has been severely impacted and you're overwhelmed. Maybe you're at home, you're a parent, and you're overwhelmed because you have prolonged exposure to your kids, especially for those of you who have little, little kids. And you're like at your wit's end, you're thinking, oh my gosh. And you never expected that at this season in your life, at this uh, point in your growth in Jesus Christ, that, that you would be feeling like there's a, the horns coming out of your head and a tail coming out of your back and a pitchfork all of a sudden lands in your hand. You never expected that, that all of a sudden you're losing it. You're, you're like that, uh, that, that character in Inside Out, the angry character. And, and you, you, it's not that you want to be angry. It's that you are overwhelmed by the circumstances. See, that causes worry. And, and for many of you, you've, do, you've been doing it long enough where you're very, very worried. You, you get overwhelmed when you have a chest pain or, you, or, or perhaps you're 
uh, you're breathing, you have short breath, and, and you get overwhelmed. You're thinking, do I have COVID-19? Have I had it, hit it already? You get paralyzed. And so the, the third thing is this. We tend to worry when we have inadequate resources, inadequate resources. Here is the boat. It's inadequate. It's a small little boat. The small boat in a big lake with a big storm, and it's inadequate. It's inadequate for what their needs are. It's inadequate to survive the storm. It's such a small boat. And that's what happens when we have bills too big, a project that is due too soon, not enough staff for expansion, or not enough staff to just stay above water, or not enough financial resources to get started once again, if you're trying to start once again. Not enough financial resources to, to be able to pull through not having income and so you're in a little boat, and you're feeling the pain of it. Because you never thought you'd be in a little boat. You thought you would always have the resources. But when your spouse lost the job, or you went halftime, all of a sudden you, you became re really, really aware that your boat is not that big. And that storm that we're in is ginormous. And it hit unexpected. And so... God does give us more than we can handle, but it's never more than he can handle. And we got to just settle into that truth and realize that that is the truth, that, that God does give us more than we can handle. But certainly it's not more than he can handle. And when we, re we realize that, then at that point we're able to say, Lord, I am weak and you are strong. And I'm going to give my weaknesses to you that you may demonstrate the greatness of your power through my weakness, right? And, 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 that's, and that's a real thing. Now, we tend to worry when we have, number four, feelings of being alone. Huge storm, unexpected, little boat, and Jesus, he's cozying up in the boat, having a little uh, siesta time, a little nap time. Now, Jesus had already preached to a thousands. He's headed towards preaching to more thousands of people, but he decides that he needs some rest. And that's, there's so much wisdom in this story, so much wisdom, in the necessity of rest, after, especially after being so, so busy and even amidst the storm, catching some rest. And Jesus demonstrates it so perfectly. He is resting in the middle of the storm. But what happens to us when we sense that, or we think that Jesus is not involved, we get worried. We start getting anxious and worried. And, and, and maybe you're here and you're listening right now, and you're thinking, where is God in all this? Certainly I don't feel him in my life. Certainly I don't know where he's at because I am stressed out like never before. And I just want to remind you that he's there with you. He's right there in your boat, in your little boat overwhelmed, he's right there. So how do you reduce this worry? Let me give you uh, four ways to do that. So let's continue in our, in our passage in verse 25 of uh, chapter 8. The disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. I love this. Save us. We're, we're, we're going to drown. It, I mean, it's really a real crisis here for them. They're very, very worried. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? I love his response. They're freaking out. They're all over the place. They all, I mean, they, they feel, you can feel the anxiety just reading the text. And Jesus' response is not like frantic or anything. He just says, why are you, why are you afraid? It gets to the root issue that worry stems from fear, right? What is your fear? Because whatever you're worried about, you're worried about that because there's an underlying fear behind it. And Jesus gets right to it. Just like Jesus is perfect at doing that with people, he gets right to the core. What are you afraid? You have so little faith. Then he got up. I love this. And he rebuked the wind and the waves. And like he talks to the winds and he talks to the waves. And suddenly there was a great calm. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man? They asked. Even the winds and the waves obey him. 
You know, when we are in, in, in awe of God's power, just like the disciples were, when we are in awe of God's power, we can't help but see the circumstances differently. When we are seeing the, the greatness of God and how big He is, we begin to see how small our circumstances really are. And when that happens, worry becomes something that's in the rearview mirror or it starts fading into the background. So how do you reduce worry? Here's the first way. Asking for help. That's how you reduce worry. You start asking for help. Here in the passage it says the disciples went and woke him up shouting, Lord, save us. We're going to drown. I mean, they were real. They were honest. Uh, they, they didn't sugarcoat it. They went straight to God, to Jesus. And they're like, save us, save us now. Some of us, that's what we need to do. We need to be raw and honest with God and just go to our knees and go before God and say, God, save us, save us now. Save me, save me now. I won't be able to make it by the end of the month financially. Lord, help us right now. I am sick and I need help. We just got to be raw with God. I want to ask you a question. How heavy do you think this glass of water is? How heavy do you suppose that this glass of water is? Some of you are trying to do the math. You know, maybe some of you are trying to like, you know, trying to figure it out between each other. You're like, hey, what, what, what is it? You know, some of you are guessing already. You know, maybe 12 ounces. You know, maybe less, eight ounces. The real question that I'm asking: How heavy? is the glass or the water in the glass has nothing to do with the actual weight of it. It has to do with uh, absolute weight doesn't matter. The longer I hold the glass of water, the heavier it becomes. If I hold it for 10 minutes, it becomes heavy. If I hold it for 30 minutes, it becomes heavier. If I hold it for an hour, it's way heavier, right? If I hold it for a whole day, this glass, all of a sudden, is heavier than it was when I first grabbed it. And for many of us, that's what we do with our circumstances. That's what we do with our storms. You know, at first, it may not feel heavy, but the more we hold on to it, the heavier it becomes. And many of us have this heaviness in our soul because we're carrying so much stress, so much worry. How long is it going to take you? To finally say, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put that, the, the weight down and give it to God. Many of us wait way too long before it even occurs to us to ask God for help or to ask others for help. We'd rather carry a heavy weight, presumably because we're pride, pride, proudful, but we'd rather do that than actually ask for help. And yet we see that if you want to reduce your worry, you got to ask. you got to ask. The second thing is this, uh, in reducing worry, is questioning your fears. Questioning your fears. Jesus responded, why are you afraid? Our worries grow out of fear, so question your fears. Some of you don't even know what you're afraid of. You're worried, and you don't even know what the real fear uh, is in your life. It's worth exploring and worth asking, like, what am I scared of? And, and just it, be introspective for just a moment and asking God reveals, put a spotlight into this and show me what am I afraid of so that I can give you my fears, Lord. The fear of what could be is oftentimes worse than the reality of what is. We tend to play the what if game. What if this? What if this? What if that? What if this? Instead of just being raw and honest with ourselves first and then before God and saying, I'm scared of death. I'm scared of failure. I'm scared of how I'm going to die. I'm scared of leaving my kids behind if I get this uh, COVID-19 or if I get cancer or if I get tumor. I'm scared of those things. It's better to be intellectually honest with ourselves so that we can be honest with God too. And we can be honest with people as well. Do a reality checklist. What are the facts of the situation? Because oftentimes, 
our fears are not rooted in facts. They're rooted in what ifs. And we have to guard ourselves from that. Remember that meditation and worry are the flip side of the same coin. I mean, they are. Uh, worry, is repeating, uh, worry is repeatedly thinking of everything that could go wrong, while meditation is repeatedly thanking God for everything that is right. Now, let me say it again because some of you are trying to write this down. Let me say it. I'm going to say it a little bit slower. Worry is repeatedly thinking of everything that could go wrong, while meditation is repeatedly thanking God for everything that is right. I want you to look at your neighbor. It might be your spouse, your kids. If you're single, just look, at the, look, look to your left or your right. Let's, let's say the Holy Spirit is there. I want you to just say it out loud. I want you to tell that person or those people that you're with, I'm going to thank God for everything that is right. There you go. There you go. Now, I want you to tell me that. I want you to just go ahead, you know, humor me at this point. I want you to tell me, Jesse, I'm going to thank God for everything that is right. Oh, there you go. You're accountable now. You said it. So here, here's the third way of reducing your worry, and that is this, increasing your faith, increasing your faith. Uh, here in this passage, it says, you have so little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the wind and the waves, and suddenly there was a great calm. You see, oftentimes we buy into the lie that by worrying, we're keeping the boat afloat. That somehow, if I just worry, I'm contributing somehow to keeping the boat from sinking. And, and I know that's like somewhat of a distorted uh, mentality or mindset, but that's just the reality of who, how we tend to operate. Instead of exercising faith, we try and exercise worry and anxiety. I heard this story not too long ago. There was a, there was a huge fire in this one home, and it was at the house. There was this, the, the father and son. And uh, as the fire started consuming the, the home, they went to the uh, the, the second floor of their home, and as they did that, uh, the dad got out first because uh, uh, he could see the best. And as he got out and and jumped down, he screamed at his son, "Jump!" Now the son couldn't see anything. the the the, the smoke was dense. He could, he couldn't see anything. The dad said, "You gotta trust me, jump!" And so the son just jumped. And the father caught his son. I mean, that's faith. You may not be able to see what's going on in terms of the circumstances that are around the current circumstance. But God sees you. Just like that father could see his son, God sees you. And he knows what's going on. And, and he wants you to trust him. He wants you to just Abandon your worries and give him the trust that he so duly deserves. You see, the same circumstances that cause our worry can increase our faith. The same circumstances that cause our worry are designed to increase our faith. You see, these circumstances, unexpected circumstances, overwhelming circumstances, uh, with a lack of resources circumstances, they're an opportunity for us to exercise faith, to trust God, even when it seems crazy to trust God. We say, God, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna trust, I'm just going to trust you, God. I'm just going to trust you. For many of us, that's the crossroads we're in. It's a trust issue, and we've got to just go there. Number four, reduce your worry by acknowledging God's control. Acknowledging God's control. The disciples were amazed. Who is this man, they asked. Even the winds and the waves, waves obey him. You see, they, got, they had God with them in the boat. And, and so realizing that God is in control, God was in control all the time. Even when God was asleep in the boat, he was still in control. Even when you don't see God at work, he is still in control. Even when you don't see God in your boat, he is still in control of the circumstances that are going on around you. Because either he permitted those things to, to happen or he allowed it. Uh, those things, or he caused those things. Now, you know, some, in some cases what happens is uh, circumstances are caused by a variety of things, a broken world, 
the, the sin of others, right? Uh, our own sin. And yet other times, it's, it's uh, God allows it. It's coming. God allows it. It's a broken world that we live in. And so in, in this situation, they realize, holy smokes, like God is in this boat. And he just calmed nature. Nature. Can God do that with, with uh, whatever disease you have? Whatever circumstance you have, absolutely, he can do that. Does he always do it? No, he doesn't always do it. God is not a genie in a bottle. He's not like a vending machine. You put a little coin, a little prayer, and all of a sudden, boom, you got your prayer of Matt. That's not God. That's not the God we serve. But he is in control. And we can trust him as the God who's in control, who has our best interests in mind, and who has our, our, his glory in mind as well. You see, you can have God with you in your life boat as well, in your boat, and he is there. In, in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11, it says, Yours is the mighty power and glory and victory and majesty. Everything in the heavens and earth is yours. Everything it says, everything, people, creation, everything it says. And this is your kingdom. We adore you as being in control of everything. I want you to say that with me. We adore you as being in control of everything. Say, say it with me again. We adore you as being in control of everything. You see, there is no situation in your life in which God does not have ultimate control of. And this is the secret of reducing, reducing worry in, in your life. The secret is that worry is not you getting more control of everything, but you recognizing that God is in control of everything. So it's not you getting more control of everything, but recognizing that God is in control of everything. That's the secret of reducing worry in your life. Now, the areas we worry about are the, mo are the most, are the areas we have not recognized God is in control. Think about it for just a second. Whatever you're worried about right now in your life is because you haven't realized that God's in control of that too. God's in control of your finances, by the way. He's in control of your, your health. He, he's in control of whatever happens in our country. He is in control of the current circumstances. He is in control. He is in control. He, he hasn't lost control. He hasn't you know, lost the wheel here. He is still in control. We've got to realize that. Maybe for many of us, this is the starting point. I'm going to end with this. For, uh, uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 7. It says, give all your worries and cares to God. Why? For he cares about you. What a beautiful challenge we get from Peter. Give all your worries and cares to God. Why? For he cares about you. God cares about you. He loves you. He hasn't abandoned you. He is right there with you in your boat. And it's about time we all recognize that God, our sovereign God, our, the God who's still king, is right here with us. At any moment, he can calm the storm. He can calm your storm, whatever your storm is. He can calm the waters if you wanted to. Let's pray. Lord Father, we thank you so much that you are the sovereign, sovereign reigning king. Of, of this universe, of this galaxy, of our world, of our globe, of our country, of our state, of our county, of our city. And we give you all the glory and the honor that you deserve. We see you as holy, just like the disciples did, that you are great. And yet, as much as they saw you as God, holy, different than themselves. They also were in the boat right there with you as friends. And we love the beauty of the good news, the gospel, that we too can have this relationship with you, Lord. Because of Christ, we can have intimacy and, and relationship with you, God the Father. And we thank you for that. Some of you are listening uh, this morning 
and God is tugging at your heart. You know it. You've just been sensing the, uh, something in your heart. By the way, that's the Holy Spirit. He's, he's, he's changing your heart. He's bringing life where, where there was death in your heart, where there was no inclination towards God. Now you see yourself having an inclination towards him. I want to encourage you to invite Jesus to be your forgiver and leader of your life because he's already calling you to do that. And so uh, maybe you would pray something that, uh, like this. And so it would be, Lord, Father, forgive me for my sins. You are my king. I accept you and receive you as my forgiver and my leader today. My Lord and my Savior. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, there are millions of angels celebrating. And I want to celebrate with you too. So send me a message. Uh, uh, put something in the notes uh, there on Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, wherever you're watching this morning. And let me know so that I can also rejoice with you. I uh, love you guys. Can't wait to see you face to face. But for now, we do online, and we'll see you next time. If, if today you enjoyed today's message and today's worship service, make sure you share it with your friends. Share it on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and let others just see what you experienced today. You guys have a good one. Until next time.